Well, thank you, Catherine, for that wonderful and generous introduction. It's really a great honor for me to be here tonight delivering the 10th Annual Spry Lecture. Has anyone here been to all the lectures? Brian, Catherine? I've been to them all. In Montreal, of course. This is the first time I've been to a Spry Lecture in Vancouver. The first lecture in Montreal was attended by Irini Spry, um, the distinguished Canadian political economist uh, that Catherine mentioned in her introductory remarks. Um, Irini, the widow of Graham Spry, was also instrumental in setting up this, uh, this series. Um, she was the matriarch of an incredible family in addition to her uh, uh, extensive uh, professional accomplishments. We were really blessed to have her with us that day because declining health prevented her from attending any subsequent lectures. Uh, Irene passed away in 1998 at the age of 91. Uh, this is the first lecture, as Catherine mentioned, since the tragic accident last March that took Robin from us. Um, Robin Spry, a pioneer of Canadian documentary, feature film, and independent production industry, um, at the very end of his, of his life, um, was intending to return to documentary filmmaking. And we will never know um, the loss that, uh, that we suffered in, um, in his premature death. Robin was the initiator and guiding spirit of this annual event, and without his vision, the Spry Endowment, um, it might never have got off the ground, and it would certainly not have been what it has turned out to be, because Robin, um, as Brian Lewis will recall, uh, really lit up at the idea of creating a truly Canadian legacy to Graham, an event that would serve to chip away at least a bit at the two solitudes that Graham had so abhorred. Um, Irene and Graham were predeceased by another son, Richard, a groundbreaking radio producer at CBC, who some of you might remember from the 1970s, uh, who was involved in the early days of such programs as Cross Country Checkup and As It Happens. And they're succeeded by um, uh, Irene and Graham's daughter, Lib Spry, uh, a well-known playwright and theater director who uh, we've been in touch with uh, in Montreal um, and who intends uh, along with her niece and nephew, uh, Robin's children, Zoe and Jeremy, to continue keeping an eye on things. So we better perform. A tremendous family, and I, I, I would really like to give them a hand. In today's lecture, I want to emphasize the dynamic nature of media, and especially the capacity of ordinary people to influence the shaping of media systems. Generally speaking, the problem I want to address is the need to place the question of media policy or making media on the public agenda. The arrival and breathtaking spread of the internet and the accompanying transformation of the way we communicate has generalized interest in media on a scale unprecedented since the introduction of television a half century ago. In rethinking where society is headed, it's necessary to pay special attention to media, to the role of the media in the new emerging political structures, and to the way in which our world is evolving. The idea of media policy is often conceptualized narrowly, as though it were limited to the government or the state. It is not limited to those alone. Indeed, with the state's retreat from public policy involvement, media policy is being increasingly handled on the periphery of formal state concerns. Media industries have made this sector one of the most lucrative and important growth areas of global capitalism, and they do not hesitate to undertake the political activity necessary to promote their interests. In recent years, a range of new non-governmental organizations, including oppositional groups in many parts of the world, have identified the media as essential to the development of a democratic public sphere and have consequently focused their attention on efforts to democratize the media. The broader public, however, has yet to identify this area as being on an equal footing with other sectors such as healthcare, education, and the environment in terms of social priority. And I think we have to raise the public profile of these issues because issues affecting media affect all other issues in our type of society. 
In the decades since Graham Spry and his colleagues in the Canadian Radio League campaigned for public broadcasting, media have changed tremendously, but the issues surrounding them remain remarkably the same. A quote from Graham Spry suggests what I mean. I invite you to imagine him saying this in his booming, thunderous voice, which some people still remember. Let the air remain as the prerogative of commercial interests and subject to commercial control, and how free will be the voice, the heart of democracy. The maintenance, the enlargement of freedom, the progress, the purity of education require the responsibility of broadcasting to the popular will. There can be no liberty complete, no democracy supreme, if the commercial interests dominate the vast majestic resource of broadcasting. Doesn't this still ring true today? I maintain that it does. The conditions in which the media are evolving today present a series of challenges which are being addressed more or less coherently in a range of local, national, and transnational settings. New questions about the appropriate role of media are finding their way onto various agendas. Governments, corporations, and a growing number of participants representing civil society are vying to influence how the media will develop. A new general framework for media governance is taking shape. And who decides? how issues of media governance get resolved, and consequently how media are used, is therefore a question that goes to the heart of how every society in the world today will experience the 21st century. For example, a global debate is being waged as we sit here on the question of how the internet will be controlled. This past month, the world's elite press was suddenly awash in reports and editorials about this debate, which has been raging at the United Nations, but largely beneath the radar of public attention since 2001. The International Herald Tribune, The Economist, The Washington Times, The Washington Post, The New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde Diplomatique, even our own Can West papers and Globe and Mail weighed in. The issue is the upcoming final phase of the World Summit on the Information Society, which will meet in Tunis next week to discuss, among other things, the issue of internet governance. And the editorialists, with the notable exceptions of The Guardian and Le Monde Diplomatique, all agreed, why is the UN getting interested in the internet? Why don't they just stay out of it, leave well enough alone? And well enough, as it turns out, is that the basic access to the technical infrastructure of the internet continues to uh, be in the hands of those who created it, uh, which is largely um, agencies related to the government of the United States of America, who through the US Department of Commerce, under a memorandum of understanding with a nonprofit corporation incorporated in California, run it. The editorialists said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, maybe it was just a low, uh, slow news cycle. Well, maybe there was something more at play here. The editorialists were concerned by the fact that most members of the United Nations, led in this case by the European Union, seemed to feel that it was ungainly to leave control over the Internet's technical infrastructure where it now lies. The topic is admittedly obscure. It's also extremely important for the future of all global communication. At stake are some basic principles about global governance in general, and a fundamental question about technologically mediated communication. What is it? Is it a commodity? Is it an individual practice? Is it a global public good? Communication technologies are increasingly understood to be instruments of social, cultural, and economic development. And governments invariably see them as well as essential support systems for political power whether benignly, as in the use of e-governance to streamline the costs and efficiency of public administration, or more malevolently, as means of spying on citizens, controlling the expression and circulation of ideas, and so on. Certain governments are campaigning vigorously to prevent the use of media technologies by opponents to their regimes. This is the case, notably, of the government of Tunisia, the host country of the World Summit, where police regularly shut down websites and hunt down and repress those who create them. It's also the case in countries such as China and Iran, among too many others, where human rights organizations continue to document cases of journalists and other communicators who are imprisoned for circulating uncomplimentary information about the government. 
And it is also the case in Canada, where so-called legal access legislation would oblige internet service providers to inform the authorities on your online activities. The point is that communication is a double-edged sword. It has tremendously increased our capacity to participate in public life. And at the same time, it has enhanced the ability of governments and corporations to track us, watch us, market to us, and eventually to gag us. And this is why policy issues, choices surrounding media continue to be so important. Which brings me back to Graham Spry. Graham Spry is also credited with the unforgettable dictum issued before a Canadian parliamentary committee studying the proposal for Canada's first broadcasting act. You have a choice, he said, and it is a choice between the state and the United States. And this has often been presented erroneously as a patriotic or nationalist statement, because when one looks at the entire quote, as I did, a more sophisticated view appears. What he actually said was, it is a choice between commercial interests and the people's interests. It is a choice between the state and the United States. And so it still is today. Again, an international story drives this point home. A month ago in Paris, 148 governments of sovereign states adopted an international convention on cultural diversity, aimed at allowing governments to continue to make cultural policies, notwithstanding the international trade agreements they may have signed. This convention represents a major diplomatic victory for Canada, which was extremely involved in getting it on the table at UNESCO and on getting it adopted. But when we use it wisely, I ask that because I sometimes feel that the only real political certainty of our time is that it is a time of consumerism driven by the desire to consume, to participate in the consumer culture. And no idealism can dare ignore this. We all take part in this system, or aspire to. The idea of the public good, then, appears to be an anomaly, unless we approach it as a fundamental ethical principle. The way we talk about the public good, for example, highlights the historic tension between commerce and culture that has marked the development of communication in Canada and continues to mark it. It is the flashpoint of what different people mean when they talk about being Canadian. It also underscores the role Canada is playing in the world in the sphere of cultural policy, where it has long served as an interesting alternative model to both the US free enterprise system and the former European public service monopolies model. The Canadian experience, in many respects, establishes the line between what is desirable and what is possible in communication and cultural policy. It also stands as a highly instructive model for reassessing and redefining the role of the state in this area.